And um, I know this is like not very sexy, but I found through much trial and error that this is the only way I can actually get my stuff done and stay reasonably healthy. Um, so 8.45 to 5.45, that's um, nine hours, which I've broken down for you here. It's one hour of administration, email bookkeeping, and it always feels like a waste of time, but if I don't do it, it always comes back to haunt me. Um, there's four hours of creative work spread throughout the day, and um, all my non-artist friends, they always, they're so jealous, and they think, oh, it must be great to sit there and think of like happy, lof lofty ideas. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's just totally not, and I think it really feels more like kind of chasing a chicken, you know, like that scene in Rocky One, where like, <laughs> <laughs> Simple, but then it's a all but impossible, and second, it looks really unglamorous. <laughs> so when I work, I produce a ton of sketches like that, and I know artists are supposed to have these pretty sketchbooks that are kind of pieces of art in their own right, and all I have is that. And I know this actually turned into a real illustration. I have absolutely no clue what's on there. Uh, so. After I'm kind of done with the creative, it's time for the execution. And the execution is divided in two parts. There's the, the um, sorry, the designing and the drawing, which is you know like actually like taking the idea, trying to find the right style for it. And then there's the second part, the, the, the staring at the screen and like wondering whether it was the right thing to do. And I mean, it's pretty amazing. It's like I spent two hours every day contemplating whether I should add or subtract three percent of magenta. Which, I've been doing this for 15 years, that kind of adds up to something like 9,000 hours. <laughs> which is, like, a lot of time for very little magenta. Which brings me to my first accomplishment. I'm really proud that I haven't gone insane yet. <laughs> you know, like, like, friends of mine, they're like lawyer and business people, and they become, yeah, through their work, they become experts in history, in the constitution, and architecture, and whatnot. And I feel, my greatest area of expertise are just like <laughs> check boxes and Photoshop. I could actually give you a 45-minute lecture on how these two things can make or break a design group, which is pretty sad. Um, but you know, back to the creative slice of that uh, pie. Yeah, I'm a designer. I'm not a machine. I cannot just like sit down and be kind of creative on command. And yeah, as you start thinking of ideas, you your mind starts wondering, and I, yeah, I like to call that part uh, inspiration, which you know, can be used for all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we had our first child, I made a resolution to be home by six every evening, which was definitely different from the kind of work lifestyle I had before. And I was afraid that this would lead to a great drop in my, uh, uh, in my output in order or the quality of the work, and I was really surprised to see that working steadily eight or nine hours every day was actually much more productive than kind of pushing my work well into the night. And I realized that I really have a finite amount of creative energy in me. And like, you know, for example, with the creative work, I work for four hours, and at some point, it just, I just uh, start producing garbage. And with uh, uh, you know, drawing and, and, and designing, maybe I can push it a little further. But there comes this time where my mind just turns numb. And even worse, like when I really kind of go into a night and like attempt something close to an all-nighter, I will pay for it with at least two days of totally crappy work after that. Um, the job that I'm most comfortable with is when a client comes to me with a clearly defined problem, and I can go out there and do my kind of illustration thing in there and be happy afterwards. Um, it's not that these kind of jobs are easier, but I really just, I feel so comfortable that there's a clearly defined object, that there's rules that then maybe you can try to break. And um, I guess like among my illustrator peers, these kind of like boring jobs are uh, a little looked down upon. And if you ask an illustrator to define a stupid job, they will say that it probably involves a client asking them to draw a businessman and or a dollar sign, yeah. which 
I try to avoid, but you know what I mean. And so the cliche is that for an illustrator, their happiness is being defined by the amount of business people they have to draw. <laughs> Which like, makes them like, more and more unhappy. And in the last couple of years, I was very fortunate to get a lot of jobs with a huge amount of creative freedom, which is, I guess, a blessing, and I, I'm very excited about it. But I know that even though creative freedom is great, I find it also extremely stressful. So I need at least three of these quite straightforward, boring jobs to I maintain my inner design of <laughs> So for me to really reliably and comfortably tackle a creative problem, I want to go at it with a really overwhelming amount of a time and also creative resources. And obviously, this is a luxury that most of us often do not have. And um, I like to actually call it the Colin Powell uh, Doctrine for Visual Arts. And if we don't have enough time, if we cannot really kind of spend a week on a little spot drawing, we, we have to push ourselves out of our comfort zone, which you know, can be a good thing. So there's really two ways how I can how I often challenge myself, or I have to challenge myself. The one is working under a crazy deadline, something where I feel like this is impossible to actually finish in that time. And the other thing is a job that um, requires an amount of skill or creativity where I just feel like I don't have that, I don't know how I should, how I should handle that. And again, it, I really think you can push your kind of creative horizon if you, if you meet these challenges. The one thing that I strongly urge you never to do is take on both of these guys at the same time. I've tried and it's always a disaster. So, um, what does it take to come up with a good idea? I would say um, it's at least 87% effort. And I guess most of you can, can corroborate, uh, corroborate that. And I have some artist friends who say, oh, you know, I just, for me it's just getting inspired, and like I go to the park, and then there's 7.5% uh, luck. Really just a pinch of that. And then of course these days, very much. <laughs> yeah. So there's two things in particular that I find really annoying when, when, they, when people say them to me or also to other people. Like the, one is, you are so talented, which always sounds actually a little bit like an insult. But it's like, mm -hmm. talent implies a natural gift. That, you know, oh, I was born with special, with special genes. I started to uh, uh, make these beautiful drawings, and eventually people started paying me for it. And I think to really to become a designer, talent is totally overrated. I really think it's really about enthusiasm. You know, why do we choose to embark on a creative career? For me, it's like you're young, and there's like some special work, there's like some piece of art, a book, a movie, and it just creates this spark. And it touches something in you, and you get so excited, and you, you're just aware of like how powerful art can be. And this is so intoxicating that this enthusiasm <laughs> turns into this like, desire, and I want to create something like that. And yet, you go out there, and you go study, and then there comes this like unfortunate realization that like, your abilities don't live up to what you actually know is possible with creativity. I really think if there's any kind of, if there's any useful talent in being a creative person, it's not like the talent to draw or talent to think, but it's really kind of like a like an extreme ability <laughs> to, kind of like, to be so excited that you kind of forget about all the little frustrations that are just uh, like an, 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 um, uh, an essential part of the of the creative process. So that brings me to the uh, second annoying thing that people, it's actually a question that people ask me, how do you overcome writer's block? Yeah, it just makes it sound like writer's block is like a skin rash, that kind of affects you every three years. My whole life is writer's block. My, my state of working is like, I sit at my desk and I have no idea what I should do, and I get really anxious that I've now officially run out of ideas. <laughs> and, um, I'm gonna give you a little cautionary tale. I had really bad back problems a while back, and I started doing yoga, and it was amazing, like what the yoga did to my back. I would have my student be packing this trick, I would go out to um, Chelsea Piers to lunch classes, and my back would get better, but also I realized my, I would get really calm and happy. So I go back to the studio, and there's this drawing that's just you know, not quite there, 
instead of thinking, oh my God, people might hate that, I have to redo that, I was like, it's not perfect. Nothing's perfect, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs>
I, um, I read this book by Stephen King on writing, which I highly recommend, and I learned that Stephen King listens to hardcore heavy metal music. <laughs> and I would actually love to listen to music. I can't. It drives me absolutely crazy. Only when I paint, then I can, then I can listen to music. Um, and it's, it's, <laughs> and so I actually think I would be a happy person working if I could listen to music, but I try and it was like, I have to think and draw. This is really complicated. Stop the, the thing going, like happening there in the background. Maybe I should just practice. Maybe, maybe I should do a camp for two weeks, where every day I try to like, do 20 minutes or 40 minutes an hour. Maybe that, that's a solution. <coughs> I mean, the, the, the one thing is that I think people are like very keen on illustration. They're, that uh, uh, I think it's going to be relevant, like where it goes stylistically or so. I have no idea. I think the big challenge is like how you actually get paid for illustration in the digital world. world. And um, I um, I guess that the whole times paywall is flawed in, in a lot of ways. I I think that's the only way ultimately. If there's a system that we go back to, like content being created, there's like a free part in terms of like here's my website, look at my work to be inspired, but that ultimately seeing the work will be under some sort of kind of paying system. And I just hope that it's going to be done in a, in, a, in a good way by smart people who love the media and who are not just trying to kind of create a system to just like get money out of people because then I think it's going to fail. So I hope that whoever it's gonna run the show, and I fear it's not gonna be Apple who can do that. Like, does it out of love for media, and not out of like, oh, we'll find a system to create money? Because I think then, then we're really in trouble. Okay. Okay. I usually have a bunch going on at the same time. There's some things, especially when it involves writing, and the problem with these, these, these abstract Sunday things, for example, is I have to, usually I have to create a solution, and there I have to create a huge problem, and then the solution, and that I find really difficult. And when I work on that, I cannot kind of do a little doodle for a like, business illustration spot on the side, but other than that, I usually work with like five, six things at a time, and whenever I feel I'm stuck with one thing, then I just work on something else. And it's something that I think happened over the years, it, uh, which I really enjoy, because sometimes you are just stuck, and you have to kind of like get loose, and instead of kind of smoking or like going to the park, you just work on something else, which I guess is more productive. <laughs> But frankly, that was like when we, when we thought about moving to Berlin, that was like my one big question, because not only the blog, but there's so much other work I do, even when you do something for politics or business, most of it has a New York angle, and there's a certain way how things are being discussed here. That it was very, and you know, ultimately I know in five years or 10 years whether I will still have jobs like that or not. Um, I try to very keenly, like, Read Gawker, which helps you in a dinner conversation. <laughs> um, I, I get to New York a week later, I read the Times. Um, I try to come here as often as I can because I feel nothing replaces that. Um, then again, there's the, the, the biggest advantage actually working from Europe for America is you're kind of getting up at three in the morning. And there are times you have six hours where nobody bothers you and you just you get your, your stuff together and then at nine o'clock here you bombard them with emails and they don't know where <laughs> 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 like, this advantage of not being here and having to artificially create us quite sense of New York, there's there's great advantages as well uh, as well. But I think nothing nothing replaces coming here, so I try to be here like six times a year. No, it's, ultimately it's just banging my head against the table. It's just, <laughs> I, I, I wish there was something else. I mean, 
honestly, I think the, the one thing you can do that really helps is you like you increase your creative comfort zone by like sitting there and actually practicing drawing, practicing writing, reading, so that it just doesn't hurt as much. And I, I know like I've I've done so many spot illustrations now that if you would tell me now like you have 35 minutes to do something on the on the, on the, the interest rates in Greece, I could probably pull something off because I've just done it so often and I've just practiced so hard. And I think ultimately the only thing I can do is uh, just keep really practicing and often I really try to say like, oh God, my, my hands look kind of like funny these days or there's a certain thing that I really struggle with drawing. So I really try to take the time to get better at that. And writing, which is a completely new thing for me, I realized I had to really practice that because otherwise it was just too, too difficult. Yeah. You know, I'm a parent myself, and every now and then when I sit on the floor in, in my kids' room and I'm playing with them, I, I, act, I really think of like, I need to channel Christoph Niemann right now. Because ever since I saw you on like a New York book, I'm like, does he sit there with his kids and constantly like do research and they just play? I mean, can you tell a little bit about how that book came about and how much your kids enjoyed the process with you in creating it or didn't? <laughs> well, you know, there's this whole thing. You have kids, so you're supposed to be a good dad and spend time with them. And the kids will play. For me, it's actually a great excuse. I love Legos so much, so they kind of sit in one corner of the room and I sit in another one. It's <laughs> <laughs> just like, being fun. And we collaborate on things. Like, <laughs> but uh, there's this. Uh, uh, what I find amazing about Lego is. Lego, for me, is about abstraction. It's about really the limitation of all these right angles. And um, your, your instinct is, of course, with, with the kids, when they want to like, build uh, uh, spaceships, they should really elaborate with like, crazy antennas and guns and what's not. And I always loved the idea of like, to make really simple ones. And sometimes I would just make these kind of spaceship out of two or three pieces. And that's really when the, when the idea came about to do abstract sculptures. Because for me, the Lego is really like a, like a three-dimensional pixel drawing. And, uh, it, it, it then actually turned out that this was the least painful of all these uh, projects because then I just like sat there with this box and I looked at these pieces. Um, <coughs> sorry, there, there was not a lot of back and forth with the kids. It was more that I snuck into their room and I got all the simple pieces out and they were sitting at my desk and some point they come out like, what are you doing with our Legos? So I don't touch them. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually I kind of gave them back to them. But they were, I think they're, they, they're really not sure what, what I was up to in these days. <laughs> One more? Somebody. Somebody's lifting their hand back there, I cannot see it, so you just have to yell. Up here. Yeah. Uh, beyond the, the, the clients and, and being in Berlin and versus being in New York, um, how do you how have you found being in Berlin from a creative standpoint? Like, how's, is the city affecting your work differently than, than living in New York? Um, have you found, have, do you miss like the, the pace of New York or? Does Berlin match it? How does the how question was about Berlin? How like the city changes my kind of creative angle? Um, I like when I thought about like the reasons like why we even considered leaving New York and how stupid can we be? Um, <laughs> it was really, like the one thing that I felt was difficult here was uh, I wouldn't really allow myself to make mistakes. It's not that I you know like don't make a ton of mistakes and, and, and screw up assignments, but more that I was trying to be a little careful and I would kind of hedge my bets and when I get an assignment I would think about oh I probably cannot go this way so I don't even like try to propose that and I found that ultimately that's a really dangerous thing in a creative uh, profession when you become a little bit too smart about the direction that you're going in and I realized that for years and years I had never really kind of wasted a week on something that everything's always like oh you always find a way to actually make it happen and so I, w I was hoping, and I actually think that this is true, that Berlin is a place because like the, the economic situation, but also like the whole spirit of the city, where it, it's easier to just like mess up and try something. Um, I, mean, I got offered a, a, a space, on like a, like, a, like a shop space on the street, and I didn't take it, but I thought like, oh, there's a thing. What if I had a studio that actually had a window and I had a gallery? There were like thoughts that I would never have here, because it was always like, okay, it's like, 
that part of space, you have that deadline, and then you just like plow, plow, plow ahead, and then eventually, like, 20 years later, you kind of like wake up and say, what did I actually do? And I find, uh, I find that Berlin is actually quite inspiring in terms of like really questions like, is this really what I want to do? And I'm just going to try some project or some angle on something, and then a week later, you realize, oh, that was another waste of time. <laughs> But ultimately, something happens there because I think to really move forward creatively, you have to allow for these kind of like dead ends to happen, and then eventually you find something. All right, thank you very, very much.